But let's just jump in. Let's jump in to our series. We've been really journeying through the gospel of Mark for a while now. And so if you have your Bibles or your phones, whatever you're more comfortable with, please turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 30 through 44 today. Verses 30 through 44 today. And I titled the message for today, Mentored by Jesus mentored by Jesus. And if, if you're here for the very first time or you're watching online here at Restoration Church, we kind of go through books of the Bible section by section. That's kind of what we do here. And so Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44, uh, th- this story, if you've been around church for a while, it's, it's, it's very familiar. It's, it's Jesus feeding the 5,000. Uh, and so it's kind of a popular uh, story. It's a, it's a popular text. And I'm not sure if you knew that, but uh, but this story is the only story that is in all of the four Gospels besides the resurrection. So this is the, the only story that happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Like this is the only story. So there's, there's definitely uh, some importance and some weight to this story. Now, let me kind of give you some context so you know kind of where we're at if you've missed a couple of weeks. Um, you know, two weeks ago, uh, I talked about how Jesus sent out the 12. Like Jesus sent out the 12. He, he instructed them. He says, hey, you know, you guys are going to go on a mission and he equips them. He instructs them. And so really, Jesus has been mentoring these disciples for quite some time now, maybe since Mark chapter 4, the end of Mark chapter 4. So he's been really developing being these 12. He's been mentoring these 12. And two weeks ago, he finally sent them out on their mission. Now, last week, there was kind of like a kind of a break in the flow. Uh, there was, it was the death of John the Baptist. We talked about the death of John the Baptist and how words are powerful. And so today, we're going to see that these disciples who Jesus sent out finally came back after their mission, and they're going to be reporting to Jesus what, had, what happened on, the, on their mission. So again, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to God's Word in Mark chapter 6. It says this, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, And they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran uh, there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Verse 37. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us today. You would speak to us clearly and that you would speak to us powerfully. God, I pray that uh, if there's anything in our life right now that's kind of distracting us, I pray that we would be able to focus on you for the next few minutes. Pray that you would encourage our faith. I pray that you would also challenge our faith. 
And God, I pray that through all this, we don't just see church as something we come to, but something we do and it's, it's who we are. We are the church. That we would take what we learned today from your word and apply it to our lives to make a difference in our community and in this world. God, we love you. We pray that you would guide us today by the power of your spirit. Amen and amen. Have you ever had a mentor in your life? Like, have you ever had someone who mentored you in your life? Or do you maybe, maybe currently have a mentor? Uh, I've been fortunate enough uh, in my life to have uh, quite a few mentors. Uh, you actually heard one of my mentors last week, Pastor Joe Dare. Anyone love that word, right? That was, that was good, man. That was really, really good. I taught him well. I taught him well. That's the only thing I taught him was just how to preach, you know. But, uh, but he taught last week, and so uh, he, he's just one of the uh, huge mentors of mine. Um, and, and he hired me as a young youth pastor. I had no experience, and he, and he kind of took me under his wing, and he poured all of his knowledge and love into my life. And I could truly say that I wouldn't be the person that, that I am today if it wasn't for him. Um, but man, one thing, if, if there's one thing that I learned from Joe was this. And he would always say this, and this is always like in my brain, like I can't get it out. He'd always come to me and he'd say, Johnny, he says, character over competence. Character over competence. Like competence and, and having good abilities will take you to the top, but only character will keep you at the top. And he was a, Joe, if you know Joe, he's a person of integrity and he's a person of character and character matters. And so that is just like engraved in my brain, but that he, that's one of the big takeaways that, that, uh, that uh, I have from his mentorship. Also, when I went to Phoenix Seminary, it was required like it was required for us to have a mentor for most of our program. Like you couldn't take classes and you couldn't graduate unless you had a mentor. So they would assign a mentor to you. And I was assigned this guy by the name of Joseph Valenzuela. And man, he's such a, a great person, great godly man. He's a pastor out in Scottsdale. And what I loved about Joseph was that he was not afraid to ask me those hard questions. Like, he was one of those mentors that didn't sugarcoat anything. Like, he just asked direct. Why? Because he cared about me and because he loved me. Uh, one of the questions he would always ask is, hey, dude, how's your marriage? Like, how's your marriage? For real, like, like how, how's your marriage? You know, how, how many times have you been sleeping on the couch this month, you know? And, like, he, he would just ask those questions. And now, at first, I'm like, man, it's none of your business, you know what I mean? But, but, but now I kind of value that because he truly cared about me. And love me. And here's the thing, uh, church, there, there's really no shortage of mentors these days. Like, there's no shortage of mentors these days. You see why? Because there's books, right? Like, there's books, there's podcasts on, on pretty much anything you could think of, leadership and spirituality, all of those things. Like, like there's, no, there's no shortage of mentors. I like to tell people, man, I, I've been mentored by uh, John Ma Maxwell. I, I, I'm mentored by John Maxwell. Really? No, I just read his books, you know, but, but you, you get what I'm saying is that we, when we read those books or listen to those podcasts, I mean, we're taking some of the best ideas and some of the best content from these people, from these great leaders, and really, and they're a blessing to our lives. So in a way, yes, you could kind of call it an impersonal mentorship, but there's a lot of mentor opportunities for us uh, out there because of uh, technology, uh, books, podcasts, social media, YouTube, all those types of things. But let me, let me tell you this. Did you know that you and I have the greatest mentor that ever walked on this planet? And his name is Jesus. Did you know that you and I have the greatest mentor ever? And his name is Christ. And in the same way, that Jesus mentored the 12, he mentors us. He mentors us through the spirit of God in us. If you're a believer, you have the spirit of God in you. He, he mentors us through the word of God, through the scriptures. He leads us and guides us. Part of the reason that I wanted to early on go through a, the gospel of Mark was to, to look at the life of Jesus so that we can see what he did and, and really do what he did and live our lives like him. And we have Jesus 
as our mentor. Now, why do we need Jesus as our mentor? Like, why, why do we need him as our mentor? And the truth is that we need Jesus as our mentor because we're on a mission. Because we have a ministry. If you are a believer, if you are a born-again Christian, you are on a mission. You are, let, let me just be very clear, you are a minister, okay? You are a minister who's on a mission to advance the kingdom of God. I think in our churches all, all the time, we, we kind of have this, uh, this mentality of like, well, the ministry's just for the pastor and staff. Like they do the ministry. And I just kind of, you know, just kind of help here and there. Or just I just attend church, but no, 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 no. The ministry is not about a title or a position. If you are a believer, if you are a Christ follower, you are on a mission. God has called you specifically. God has called us on a mission to help people come to know him, to, to help people who are hurting and broken and lost and need hope. And he's using you. He could have used anyone else. He could have, he could have done it like this if he wanted to, but he said, no, I want to use people to reach people. And it's a great mission, guys. If you've been in church for a while, you know that this mission is great and this mission is bigger than ourselves to make a difference in people's lives, to, to change eternity for people's lives. Uh, this week, I got the amazing news that someone here at Restoration Church committed their life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And their whole eternity has changed because of the ministry here at Restoration Church and because of your ministry and your prayers for this person. Eternity matters. Our mission is huge. Our mission is big. And for a mission so great, we need an even greater mentor in our lives. Now, here's the thing. We are always being mentored by something or someone. Like we're always being mentored by something or someone. Well, what's the basic definition of being a mentor? It's simply to guide, right? A mentor guides and advises, right? He, he influences a person's life. And we are always being mentored by what we take in. Some of us are being mentored by what we watch on TV. It's guiding our life. It's guiding our perspective. It's influencing our lives. We're being mentored by our friends or family or co coworkers. They have influence and guidance in our lives. We're being mentored by what we read and who we read. We're constantly being mentored. And here's the thing. Whatever or whoever guides our lives will influence our ministry and mission. Whatever's, whatever you're letting into your life, whatever is guiding you, whoever is mentoring you will have an impact on how you do ministry and on the mission that God has called you to do. So as believers on a mission, as believers doing ministry to seek and save people, we must have the right mentor in our life. And in today's passage, we're going to see as Jesus continues to mentor his 12 apostles. And like I said, over the past three sermons, Jesus is in the faith development business. Uh, Jesus is stretching the disciples' faith. Jesus is putting them in situations where they're not comfortable. Jesus is teaching them to strengthen them and grow them and develop them. And I really think today, in today's story, we're going to see three principles as uh, how we can apply Jesus' mentorship to our lives as we minister, as we live a life on a mission to help people know Jesus. And there's three of them. If you're taking notes, write these down. The first is this, rest over rust. Rest over rust. That's the first thing we could learn from Jesus' mentorship with these 12 disciples, rest over rust. So the apostles return, right, from their mission. And they go to Jesus and they, they start to report like everything that happened. Man, and they had an effective ministry. They healed a lot of people. They, 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 they uh, delivered a lot of demons from people's lives. They, they, they taught the gospel. And so they returned to Jesus to tell him how successful their ministry was. And what does Jesus do? 
What does Jesus do? If you look at verse 31, Jesus basically says, hey, you know what? You need some rest. You need some rest. And the verse says this, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. That's the first thing Jesus tells them. Dude, you guys have been busting your tail. You've been out there walking and preaching and being with people to the point that you just, you haven't ate. You need to, you need to rest. You need some R&R time. You need some, you need some relaxation time. And Jesus knew what it was like to do ministry. Jesus knew what it was like to get tired and weary of doing ministry, of serving the Father with everything that he had. In John chapter 4, we see that Jesus is by a well sitting down because he's exhausted of doing ministry. So he knows what it's like, and he sees the disciples, and he, he realizes, man, these guys don't have a sustainable pace. They don't have a sustainable pace. They can't continue to minister this way, and they need some rest and relaxation. Now, notice what Jesus says about the rest, though. He says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Notice that. He said, rest a while. He doesn't say, and rest forever. He says, rest a while. He puts a time limit on this rest. Why? Because rest for the believer is not permanent. Rest for the believer has a time, okay? Jesus called us and the disciples to rest, not rust. He he called his disciples to rest, not rust. He didn't want them to be a one-hit wonder. Hey, we went out, we served you one time, we're done. That's, that's Christianity. We're done. We did it one time, checked off the box. We're good. He didn't want them to do that. He didn't want them to be one and done. Rest for the believer is temporary. There are times of rest for the believer, but it is not permanent. So church, let me encourage you, don't get lazy in your spiritual walk with God. Don't get lazy in serving Jesus with all of your heart. It's not permanent. You never We never retire from kingdom work. Some of us have retired from our careers, but we never retire from kingdom work until we take our very last breath here on earth. There's always more work to do for the believer. And so Jesus says, hey, rest, but rest a while. It's temporary. I don't want you to rust and just be useless. I want you to rest for a while. And he says, Mark tells us that the disciples were serving Jesus so much that they couldn't even eat. They didn't even have time to eat. And so they were, they were more focused on the needs of the people than our own needs. And on the outside, that looks very great. That looks good. That looks honorable, right? Like we're serving, we're serving to the point that we're not even eating. It looks honorable, but it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. There's always balance in the Christian life as well. You see, the disciples, if they didn't eat, they, would, they couldn't be effective in ministering to people. So yes, we are to serve sacrificially. We should, we should serve others sacrificially, but at the same time, we should take care of ourselves. There's a balance to the Christian life. And so Jesus says, hey, go rest. Go take a time out. You need it. Let me ask you this question. How many pastors do you think burn out each month from ministry and call it quits? How many pastors do you think burn out from ministry in one month? How many? How many? A study from the Schaefer Institute reported that 1,700 pastors leave the ministry each month citing depression, burnout, or being overworked as the primary reasons. 1,700 pastors leave because of burnout. That's not even other things. Simply burnout alone. It's real. And here's the thing. This doesn't just happen with pastors. 
This also happens with church members. Church members get burnt out as well. They get tired. There's always giving and giving and giving and giving. And here's the cool thing about Restoration Church, man, that I love this, that almost all of our church serves in some capacity. That is what I love about our church, that we're carrying the load together, that, that hey, maybe in some places, it's those very few that do a lot of the work here at Restoration Church, everyone serves. And I just love that about our church. And so not only do pastors get burnt out, but so do church members. I've seen it happen. I've had it happen. I've had volunteers where I just, man, I just overworked them and they bailed. And so that's why I think for Christina and I and for the leadership team, we're just so, um, uh, we, we love to give people breaks when they need it. We're okay. We, we know that life happens in people's lives. We know that church and, and serving and volunteering is, is just one aspect of a person's life. And so we're always accommodating people and being very um, understanding of where people are in their lives to avoid burnout, man, because the burnout is real. And it happened to me. It happened to me at the very end of, uh, uh, of my youth ministry days. Man, I got burnt out. And our students, uh, here's the thing, uh, our students caught on that I was getting burnt out because I was super negative. I was super critical. And, and, and I was just in a bad attitude all the time. And they would call Sundays salty Sundays because I was there. I mean, that's not good. When your students are calling Sundays salty Sundays, that's not good, okay? If you know what salty means, ask a millennial. They'll tell you, okay? Um, but, but man, nobody wanted to be around a person with such a negative attitude, super critical. Just, you know, nobody wanted to be around that. And I started noticing this too that I started losing volunteers. I did, because I was super burnt out, came out negative, critical, because I was burnt out. So the burnout is real, both for pastors and church members. Let me ask you this. How's your pace right now? Like, How's your pace? Are you resting regularly? Like, like how's your pace of life? How's your rhythm? of life right now? Are you burnt out? Like, are you overloaded? Like, how's your pace? How's your rhythm? Are you sustainable right now? Because if we're going to be effective ministers of the gospel, then we must learn to chill out. Like, we must learn to chill out because only those who chill out are going to be useful in the kingdom of God. Because what are the other two options, right? What are the two options if we don't chill out? We're either going to rust out or we're going to burn out. So where are you right now? Are you rusted out? Hey, man, I'm just not, I'm not in it. You know, I'll let everybody else serve. Are you burnt out? I'm overworked. Or do you kind of need some rest to chill out? You see, Jesus called us to chill out, not to rust out or burn out. We're no good if we rust out. We're, We're no good if we burn out. So we got to take care of ourselves if we're going to take care of other people. we got to find a sustainable pace. And so I just want to give you some practical things that, and some practical questions that I ask myself when I start to feel off balance, when I start to feel overwhelmed, when I start to feel very anxious and can't sleep at night. These are some of the things that I ask myself. The first thing I ask myself is this, kind of like a, a check-in, a routinely check in for my life. The first question is this, am I in love with Christ? Am I in love with Christ? Like, like is my, am I passionate about Jesus? Because I've noticed that when I'm completely burnt out, when I'm overworked, when I'm overstressed, man, me and Jesus don't even talk. Like there's no passion, there's no relationship, there's no desire. And that's the first thing that usually goes. Am I in love with Christ? Number two, Very practical things. Am I sleeping enough? Am I sleeping enough? I mean, going to bed and getting some rest and sleeping in on the weekends is one of the most spiritual things that you can do. Just to get some rest. Just to stop whatever you're doing and just sleep. Number three, am I taking regular days off? Am I taking regular days off? You see, I had a, a workaholic problem. I would work and work and work and work, and man, I just wouldn't stop working all night. 
And I ended up burnt out. I ended up tired. It was not a sustainable pace. And what I realized, though, through that is that when, when I wouldn't take a day off, when I wouldn't have time for rest, you know what I was really saying? I was really saying that I didn't trust God. Like, God, I have to work so hard in my own strength because I don't think you could handle it. Like, I don't think you can do it. And so really, no days off indicated no trust in God. So are you regularly taking days off? Number four and five kind of go together. Am I eating healthy and am I exercising? Am I eating healthy and am I exercising? Uh, recently, uh, for the past maybe two months, I think, uh, my wife and I have taken our health very, very serious. Uh, we have gone to, we go to the gym every single morning at seven o'clock. And honestly, that has just really, really helped me in just a practical way to kind of relieve some of that stress, to, to kind of relieve some of that tension and anxiety that I have. I hope you noticed I've kind of gained some muscle mass. I'll show you later. I'll post it on social media. But am I, am I eating healthy? Am I exercising? Man, I, honestly, these days, I have to go to the gym or else I'll feel just stressed and burnt out. Like, I just need to do that. Number six, am I investing in godly friendships? Am I investing in godly friendships? Look, we were created to do life together. And, and part of resting is finding people who are going to influence you in a positive way, who are going to speak into your life, who are going to pray with you, encourage you, and challenge you, lift you up when you need it. Number seven, am I spending time with people I love? Are you spending time with family and friends, those people that you just, that, that recharge you and give you energy, where you find great joy to be around? And lastly, am I saying yes to too many things? Am I saying yes to too many things? Are you always saying yes and yes and yes? And you have all of these things on your plate and you're just juggling everything and things are falling through the cracks. I want to remind you of a, of a, of a quote that I heard one time. That every time we say yes to something, we say no to something else. Let me repeat that again. Every time we say yes to something, we say no to something else. So be careful what you say yes to. Isn't that interesting? That the very first thing that, that Jesus tells his disciples after they report back to him is like, hey, go rest. Go rest. So rest over rust. Second thing, compassion over complaining. Compassion over complaining. Now, now, now I want you to do this. I want you to put yourselves in the disciples' shoes for a second. Put yourself in their shoes for just one second. So you, you, Jesus sends you out in his authority. You go out and you're doing ministry. I mean, you're having a, an effective, booming, successful ministry. You're healing people. You're praying for people. You're preaching the gospel. You're doing all that stuff. You come back to report to Jesus. You're exhausted. You're tired. You're hangry. Some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about when you guys get hangry. I don't want to see that from some of you, but just put yourself in their situation. That's what's going on with them. They're, they're, they came back. They're exhausted and they're tired. And you report everything to Jesus. Hey, we did all this stuff. And so Jesus tells you, okay, well, go and rest. And as you're on your way to rest, the crowd sees you. The crowd notices you. Hey, those were the people that were healing. We, we got to go and, and, and hang out with them. We got to go and hear them preach again. We, we need to be ministered by them. And so here, you're thinking you're going to get a day off. Here, you're thinking you're going to get some rest. But what just happened? The crowds followed Jesus and the disciples to the other side of the lake. Mark actually tells us that they beat them to the other side of the lake. And so now you, you're thinking you have some rest, but you're working overtime. You're working overtime. You thought you were going to eat, but you ain't eating because there's more ministry to do. Let me ask you this question. Be honest with yourself. If you were in the disciples' shoes... And you knew you're hungry and you're tired and you were about to get some rest, but you couldn't because you have to work overtime. Would you complain or would you have compassion? Be honest with yourself. Would you complain or have compassion?
I would have compassion. I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm perfect. I would, I would have compassion. I wouldn't complain. I, I'm perfect. I would complain. I would complain. Like, Jesus, I'm tired. Let, give me like 15 minutes at least, man. Just give me 15 minutes. I just need to be by myself. Do you complain or do you have compassion on people? How did Jesus respond? Mark tells us that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus didn't complain if there was more work. The disciples didn't complain if there was more work. They had compassion on these people. The verb compassion means this. It means to have pity, a deep empathy, expressing a deep compassion in one's stomach. The verb is like what is expressed in modern language as a feeling in one's gut or heart. It's a deep empathy. It's a gut-wrenching compassion for people. That's what the word compassion here is in the biblical terms. It's a gut-turning, gut-wrenching compassion. Where, where have you ever received bad news from someone and your stomach literally hurts? Have, have you ever, has that ever happened to you? That, that's, what, that's what he's talking about here. Where his stomach literally hurt because they were she, like sheep without a shepherd. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this about the desperate situation, human sheep face without the shepherd. This is what he says. He says, there were, there were questions, but no answers. Distress, but no relief. Anguish of conscience, but no deliverance. Tears, but no consolation. Sin, but no forgiveness. That's what he says about human sheep without a shepherd. Essentially, what he's saying is that sheep without a shepherd are lost, in danger, and without hope. And so that's the way that Jesus saw these people, this crowd of thousands. He had compassion on them because they were in danger. There was no one to guide them. There was no one to deliver them. There was no one to teach them. There was no one to love them. There was no one to care for them. And although they've worked and worked and worked, they didn't complain. But Jesus had compassion on these sheep. And I got to tell you this other thing. Sheep, if you've ever studied sheep, sheep are dumb. Like sheep are really, really dumb. I I hope you, like just study sheep, but sheep are so dumb, okay? And uh, I actually have a video for you. It doesn't have sound, but I I saw it on Facebook and I'm like, I just got to show you how dumb sheep are. Okay, that is why we need a shepherd, okay? Like, that is why we need a shepherd, because sheep are not smart, sheep are a little dumb, and we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd. Notice what Jesus, oh, this is so good. Notice what Jesus does next after he had compassion on them. What does Mark tell us? Mark tells us that Jesus felt this gut-wrenching compassion, right? What does he do? He begins to teach them. He begins to teach the people. That is so interesting. Out of all of the things he could have done, he began to teach the people. His compassion compelled himself to love and teach the people, to meet their spiritual need first. Our greatest need is not a physical need, but a spiritual need. And that's what Jesus does. When he felt compassion on them, he said, hey, I feel so much compassion that I'm going to meet their greatest need. And their greatest need is not a physical need. Yes, he does that later, but he begins to speak to their heart. He begins to speak to the condition of their heart. Now, my question is, what do you think Jesus taught them? Have you ever wondered that? What do you think Jesus taught them? I'm reading into the text a little bit here, but I think what he did, I think Jesus went to the Old Testament. I think he went to Numbers 27, where Moses pleaded with the Lord to raise up a leader so that the people of Israel won't be like sheep without a shepherd. I think he went to Numbers 27 and he said, hey, you know that that prophet that Moses was talking about? 
that, 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 that shepherd that Moses would, would ask God for? That's me. That's me. And he would explain the Old Testament in light of himself. I think he would go to Ezekiel 34, where the shepherds of Israel had neglected and abandoned the sheep. They didn't chase after the sheep. When the sheep were herding, the shepherds of Israel didn't heal the sheep. And in Ezekiel 34, God says that that he will shepherd them through his servant, David. And so I think Jesus opened up to Ezekiel 34 and he said, hey, you know that, that, that servant David that the God would send? Hey, you know what? I'm the greater David. I'm the greater king shepherd. And I'm here to shepherd you. I'm here to lead you. I'm here to guide you. And so he would take the Old Testament and reveal himself through it. And so Jesus and his disciples, man, they had some compassion on people. My question is this. How's your compassion? How's your compassion? How's your compassion meter towards people? Do you have a gut-wrenching compassion for the people that God has placed in your life? Do you complain? Do you have a gut-wrenching compassion for the people in your life that God has placed in your life? The ones that annoy us, the ones that are hard to love, the ones that hurt us. How's your compassion towards them? When you see their text messages or phone calls, do you complain? Do you ignore them and send them to voicemail? When they text you, do you not text back? How's your compassion towards people? You see, here's the thing. We all want to love people, right? Like we always, you know, Christians always talk about, oh man, we want to love the world. Jesus called us to love the world. We want to love and love and love. But here's the thing. We can't love without compassion. We can't love without compassion. Compassion, gut-wrenching compassion compels us to love. Compassion is a feeling that leads to an action, love. Love is an action. And so if we're going to love people and make a difference in the world, we must have compassion for people. Compassion that leads to action. So what can we learn so far from Jesus mentoring his disciples? Rest over rust. Compassion over complaining. And lastly, do over doubt. Do over doubt. The disciple and the crowd and Jesus were, they were in a desolate place and Jesus was teaching them and it was getting very, very late. So the disciples told Jesus, hey Jesus, how about you send these people away? I mean, we're in, we're in the desert, man. Like it's getting late. Like make sure, you know, you could dismiss them so they could buy themselves something to eat. And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus do? He says, you guys give them something to eat. You guys feed them. Jesus asked his disciples to do something. He asked them to do something that seemed impossible for them. He asked them to do something. He didn't ask them to doubt. He asked them to do something. And again, like I mentioned earlier, Jesus is in the faith development business. He is developing the disciples' faith. I mean, think about it. Scholars say there was about 15 to 20,000 people and the 12 disciples were supposed to feed everybody. I mean, that is impossible. What would you have done? How would you have responded if you were a disciple? You know, there's this, this, this saying that gets quoted all the time that God won't give you more than you can handle. Can't handle. You ever heard of that? That God won't give you more than you can't handle. That is totally false. That is totally false. Ask the disciples. First of all, that is a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That's not what the passage talks about. God will give you more than you can handle so that you can look to him in dependence and trust and in faith. Jesus was calling them to do something, but what did they do? They doubted. They began to crunch the numbers. They begin to have a financial meeting, an assessment. 
okay, so there's 12 of us. How much change do you have in your pocket? How much do you got? To take it out, guys. Anybody have a credit card? Let's do this. There's about 20,000 people. How are we going to feed these people? You know, if, you div- if everyone just takes a lick of a fish, you know, whatever. Like, they begin to crunch the numbers. They begin to doubt. But Jesus didn't call us to doubt. He called us to do, to do whatever he's called us to do, to go do what he called us, to love people, to preach the gospel, to show grace and mercy. And so the disciples are like, man, we don't have enough. They said, Jesus, 200 denarii. To you, where am I going to get 200 denarii from? 200 denarii was about a year's wage. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And they didn't have that kind of money. Jesus then asked them, okay, what do you have? And so they quickly surveyed the crowd and they brought back five loaves and two fish. In the other gospel, the gospel of John chapter six, it it actually teaches us that this food was from a young boy. So they stole a kid's lunch. (laughs) They stole a kid's lunch. Basically, that's what they did. They stole a kid's lunch and brought it to Jesus. And so Jesus commanded the people to sit in groups. And after they were seated, he took the five loaves and two two fish and said a blessing and broke the loaves. And he gave it to his disciples to set before the people. And everyone ate. And everyone ate. And everyone was satisfied. And I love what Mark tells us here. He says, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish, 12 disciples who doubted God, 12 basketfuls of bread and fish that were left over. Do you think it was a coincidence? I don't. It was a reminder to the disciples to don't doubt. Don't doubt God. Don't doubt God. Just do what he's called you to do. If there's one quote that I've hung on to through this whole church planning ministry thing that we've been doing through this pandemic, it's this. Hudson Taylor, a great missionary, he says, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. Never, never. God will always supply for what he's called you to do. If he's called you to do something, do it. He will supply you. He will equip you. He will empower you. He will provide whatever you need. You just got to step out in faith as a minister of the gospel. So the question is then, are you a doer or are you a doubter? Are you a doer or are you a doubter? Doers do what only they can do and trust Jesus to do what only he can do. Doers do what only they can do and trust Jesus to do only what he can do. Doers recognize that the little they have, Jesus can make it more. Doers recognize that a little can become more in the hands of Jesus. Doers look at the abundance, not the lack. Doers see possibilities, not problems. Are you a doer or are you a doubter? So church, I just want to encourage you to do this. It's one very practical thing. It's to make Jesus the mentor of your ministry. Who's mentoring you? Who's leading you? Who's guiding you? Where are you getting your worldview from? Where are you getting on on how to treat people? Like who's speaking into your life? Listen, you have a mentor. His name is Christ. And he wants to mentor you. He wants to shepherd you through the spirit of God and the word of God. Let him lead you. Let him mentor you. Why? Because our mission is great. Our mission is big. And he's called you and I to rescue people, 
to love people, to save people, to heal the hurting, to care for the broken. It's a big mission, and we need a great mentor in our lives.